Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, uh, first of all, Felipe, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I mean, it's the miracle of technology that uh, all the researchers from all over the world, um, myself from now in Sydney and uh, you guys uh, in Brazil, uh, have the opportunity to share some of the exciting developments in the area of sports injuries that I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, and a very um, a deep and personal thank you to you, Felipe, for all the years of collaboration um, and, and for your friendship and uh, for the invitation again uh, today to speak. Uh, as, as you said, I gave a very similar presentation. Actually, I was just looking at this uh, yesterday. It was almost exactly two years ago, or three years ago, I think, uh, in 2012. And back then I was in New York City. Um, and now I'm, I'm in Australia. Many things have changed since then, but one thing that has not changed is the passion to try to solve some of these uh, really debilitating problems for our athletes. Um, so, so my presentation today, some of you may have heard some of this information before, uh, I, I, but I do have a lot of new information for you. Um, we, you know, I, we try to keep it uh, informal as uh, much as we can. I know that it's early in the morning on Saturday morning for you. It's uh, a little bit after 10 o'clock uh, at night for us here in Sydney. Uh, so if you, uh, any, you, Felipe, or, or any of the other participants uh, want to ask any questions at any point, I'll be checking the chat and I will be trying to address that. Uh, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, so as Felipe said, I'm, a, I'm an associate professor at the University of Sydney and my area of specialization is in the area of knee injury and rehabilitation uh, related to sports injuries and, and more specifically to anterior cruciate ligament injuries. Uh, ACL in uh, English or I believe it's CLA in, uh, in Portuguese. Uh, and so, and some of you may have been here at the University of Sydney. We have a very active laboratory, a uh, very successful laboratory about half half of our students and, and and work at our laboratory are Brazilian and I think that has a lot to do with uh, the reason that it is successful uh, hopefully uh, more of you you'll get the opportunity to come and visit here and uh, hopefully soon we'll have Felipe um, and we're going to strengthen this collaboration um, so uh, what we'll, I'll talk a little bit about today and, and I'm going to structure the first part of this talk uh, as uh, talking a little bit about the epidemiology of ACL injuries, uh, then the outcomes and then the etiology, what causes ACL injuries. So first of all, to describe the problem, uh, we have probably about a quarter of a million ACL injuries in the US every year. Um, most of you, I assume, have a physio background. Uh, but uh, just for, for those of you who don't, uh, the anterior cruciate ligament or ACL is right in the center of the knee. It's a ligament about the, the size of the little finger in each person and can be a femur. Now under certain circumstances, and we're going to talk about when that happens, this ligament breaks. Uh, and when it breaks, uh, the knee becomes immediately swollen, unstable, and uh, down the road, as we will see, there are many problems that are developing within the knee. So it is important to know how prevalent this problem is. Uh, and as I said, about a quarter million people in the United States suffer an ACL injury every year. Uh, in, in the country where I live now, in Australia, we have about 10,000 ACL reconstructions. We don't know how many more do not uh, uh, have an ACL reconstructed because some they have the ligament reconstructed and some uh, they stay ACL deficient. It is a rather large cost for our uh, healthcare system, about 75 million uh, Australian dollars every year just for the ACL reconstruction, just for the surgery. Now we know for more than 20 years that female athletes that are at higher risk for uh, this injury than male athletes uh, and in the United States the cost actually this figure is probably very outdated at this point uh, back um, you know 14 years ago 15 years ago it was uh, it was close it was approaching one million dollars per year now it's it's a much larger figure um, we also know that those athletes who tore their ACL they are at much much higher risk of tearing either the same ACL the graft 
or the opposite ACL. So there seems to be that uh, athletes who uh, are, are predisposed to this injury. So it's not a random injury, but there is something that puts some people at a much, much higher risk than others. And this uh, creates an opportunity for us because if we find what causes the ACL injury, then we can potentially prevent it. Um, so one of the earlier studies that we published uh, in Sports Health uh, with uh, Tim Hewitt and his group was an epidemiological study uh, because, as we said before, we know that uh, uh, female athletes they tear their ACL more frequently. However, we don't know if that is true throughout the entire lifespan uh, or if it's at a certain age group. So one of the studies that we did is we looked at emergency department data and this was a national study so we could see at the number of injuries through a complex sample design all over the United States. Uh, and the, a very interesting thing that we found is that for those children who play sports and that they're at elementary school, they have a very, very low risk of knee sprain. It's about 2% and it's the same for men and women. Then around puberty, when they go to high school, um, that's when you can see that there is both uh, the risk increases for both males and females, and that's when you see the females at going at a much higher risk. This continues at college age level, and we've known that for a number of years. It probably exacerbates even more after college, and then after uh, age 35, that's when both males and females are at similar risk, and the risk goes down. So some puberty that puts the uh, female athletes at a higher risk than the male athletes. Uh, and that creates a, a window of opportunity for us to try to intervene at the right time and prevent uh, this injury if possible. Um, now, one thing that I want to, uh, you know, just uh, <laughs> I was uh, I, I was in uh, France for an orthopedic surgery conference and it was four days, uh, you know, that just happened just last month. It was four days of talking about the minute orthopedic surgery detail of how to uh, reconstruct the after it has been torn. Uh, the talk there in front of, you know, uh, almost uh, a little bit over 4,000 orthopedic surgeons from all over the world, some from Brazil. Um, and one of the things that I said is that uh, there is plenty of evidence at this point that to show that after an ACL is torn and reconstructed, it's never the same. And there is plenty of very consistent research to show that even though doing surgery after an ACL tear uh, has some benefits in terms of restoring the uh, stability of the knee, especially in the uh, anterior posterior uh, plane, so the tibia does not translate too much anteriorly compared to the femur, uh, there is plenty of evidence to show that once the ACL tears, it never goes back to normal. So even after with the best surgery, with the best rehabilitation, there's always, it's always a weak link in the patient, uh, in, in the athlete, when uh, the athlete returns to sports. Um, a few years ago, I did a sabbatical in Greece and with the PhD students there, we published uh, quite a few papers and consistently we've shown strength deficits, uh, rotational deficits, uh, even deficits, the PCL index, as you can see down here on the bottom right, um, that even after reconstruction of the ACL, the tibia still sits a little bit too anteriorly. Um, and all that just demonstrates how the uh, uh, ACL, after it tears, it cannot be really reconstructed to the same extent that it was before. So after the ACL tears, uh, the athlete loses an entire season of sports participation. Uh, that leads to decreased activity levels, not only in the short term. Many athletes never return back to sports. In the United States, some of them, they have to uh, give up an athletic scholarship and uh, just for fight their dreams to go to college because of uh, this serious injury. Uh, a research project showed that it uh, leads to lower academic performance. Um, and we used to think that about 90% of them, they return to sports. However, recent data out of uh, Melbourne here showed that only one out of three athletes returns to competitive sports within a year uh, and two, um, between half and two thirds return to sports within, within two years. Um, 
But the most important point is the last one that you can see on this slide here is that the athlete who suffers an ACL tear uh, within, a few, within a number of years, uh, usually within 10 to 15 years, they develop symptomatic osteoarthritis. And that has been shown over and over and over from data from Scandinavia that regardless of whether the athlete opts in for surgery or for uh, 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 conservative treatment, uh, within 10 to 15 years, they develop osteoarthritis. And this is a very heartbreaking situation that we see at the clinic, and you guys probably see it at, at, in Brazil too, where we have the young athlete who's 25, 30, 35 years old, they're at the peak of their lives, ready to start a family, they're doing really well at work, they really want to keep active, but they have an 80-year-old knee because after multiple surgeries and injuries or even just the simple effect of an ACL tear 10 years uh, after the patient suffered it leads to symptomatic osteoarthritis. And we don't have a lot of good treatments for these athletes because they're too young uh, to, to uh, get a knee replacement. And we all know that the knee replacement actually does not uh, give the opportunity to do some of the impact sports that uh, people at this age group really want to do. So I hope by now I convinced you that uh, it is a really serious injury. Um, so we have to prevent it uh, and because we cannot fix it very well. So we have to prevent it. So in order to prevent a type of injury, we need to know what causes it. Uh, and there are many, many papers that talked about a variety of factors uh, that have that, that are potentially contributing to ACL injury, anything from environmental, people who have lax joint, hormonal factors, um, uh, anatomical factors like the notch or the slope of the tibia, um, experience of the athlete as well as biomechanical factors have been implicated into ACL injury. Uh, even back in 1999, the first consensus conference on ACL injury uh, said that biomechanical factors are probably the most important reason for the increased risk of ACL injuries in women. And the primary recommendation was that research efforts should concentrate on biomechanical risk factors. Um, so if we are going to look into the biomechanics of ACL injury, then we have to know what type of tasks, when does the ACL tear, what does the athlete do when the ACL tears. Um, and there are a few different activities that are responsible for it. So first of all, one out of three injuries is non-contact. Uh, I'm sorry, it's contact. So it's the result of usually another athlete uh, having direct contact, falling or pushing or tackling uh, another athlete. We cannot prevent those injuries unless we change the rules of the sport. So I'm not going to talk about this uh, so much today. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on the non-contact injuries. So these are the injuries that the athlete does a similar thing that he or she did thousands of times before. For example, landing from a layup in basketball or landing from a jump in volleyball or cutting, dribbling around an opponent in uh, soccer. Uh, and although they did that many times before, this time without any external contact, just, just from the force of the own body of the athlete, the ACL pops, breaks, and then uh, it starts the cascade of events that we discussed earlier. So there are two tasks, there are two athletic tasks that are responsible for this. Uh, one is landing from a jump and the other one is changing directions, as we call cutting. Uh, and we know that uh, these tasks, when the athlete performs this task, it's being the first 50 milliseconds where the ACL breaks. So now that we know exactly, you know, what are the tasks and the time frame that this happens, then we can zero in and we can look into uh, what are the athletes that are at higher risk and uh, that will give us some insight into the etiology of these injuries. Um, so next I would play a video. Uh, I guess you guys can play a video. I don't think I can play it from here. So if you can take a look at this video here. It's a rather gruesome injury. Um, okay, so yes, yeah, so uh, Felipe has put a link there. So I'm going to give you a few seconds uh, to click on the link and then play that video.
Okay, so I see uh, here, this is an example of a contact injury. This is from American football. Uh, I should have warned you that it's a very graphic injury. Uh, and, you know, I hope it didn't scare you too much, but uh, this this is one way that the ankle breaks. This particular asset, a, a dislocation of the knee. So both the ACL and the PCL tore, as well as the MCL. And when we have both cruciates and one collateral ligament, then we're talking about a knee. As I said before, this of this injury not prevent unless we change the rule of the sport. Um, then moving on to uh, the the non-contact injuries uh, that we're going to dis be discussing, so mainly landing and then cutting. There are there are a few theories that have been suggested as contributing to uh, ACL tear. So, for example, that uh, some people have suggested that athletes land with a straight knee. So the athletes who land with a straight knee are more likely to suffer an ACL injury. Uh, the research shows that this is probably not true. Uh, we used to believe that back in the 90s. Recent research has showed that uh, it's a rare mechanism of injury and that both men and women, they uh, land with similar knee flexion. The next one is the ligament dominance theory, and that suggests that athletes who allow their knee and the lower, the lower extremity to collapse inwards into knee valgus and hip adduction and internal rotation, once again, knee valgus, hip adduction and internal rotation, so the knees move in, uh, they are more likely to suffer an age. And there is a lot of support for this theory, the, especially the knee valgus component. Then there's the leg dominance theory, uh, and we're going to be discussing some of the work we've published in this area. And this suggests that if one leg behaves differently than the other leg, for example, during a bilateral landing, if one foot touches down first, or if one knee moves into more knee valgus than the other, this is the, the, the leg dominance theory, and there is some support to suggest that this plays a role into ACL tears. And we have the trunk dominance theory that suggests that athletes who cannot control the trunk very well, so the trunk moves to the side when they play sports, uh, they put more stress within the ACL, and, the, and there is uh, some support for this theory too. And then finally, the quadriceps dominance theory. And that, that's a pure biomechanical theory that suggests that, well, the quadriceps being on the front of the knee, when it contracts, it pulls the tibia forward, therefore increasing the stress on the ACL, while the hamstrings protect the ACL by pulling the uh, tibia backwards. Um, and, and again, the, the, this dominance theory here suggests that if athletes, uh, they have overdeveloped and overused their quadriceps, and while their hamstrings are not as developed, then they are more likely to tear their ACL. Um, so this is very important for the rest of the talk today to understand these theories, especially the, the ligament dominance theory that is associated with knee valgus, uh, because next I'm going to be discussing some of the evidence that is surrounding these theories. Um, so here is an example of these type of injuries that we are hoping to prevent. Um, so I think Felipe is going to share another Dropbox link with you uh, that is not as bad as the previous one. Um, there it is. So if you click on on the right on the chat, then you will be able to look in, uh, into the uh, this video. So here is a, a gentleman uh, who puts up a camera on, on his backyard and he shows some uh, soccer tricks that he learned recently. And you can see that he does exactly the same task where he kicks the ball with his right, where, where, where he allows his uh, left leg to go over the ball. That's the trick that he learned. And then he lands on his right knee. Um, and he does this twice, the first time successfully, the second time the ACL breaks. Uh, so this allows us to do a little bit of forensic work as they do at CSI, you know, on TV, where they go back and they try to reconstruct the crime. So we can take the both landings, the successful landing and then the landing where he tore his ACL, and we can uh, see how these two are different. Uh, and I'm going to be showing you some pictures for you um, for that. Um, so... 
Now, going back into some of the work that we have done in our laboratory, um, in order to solve the mystery of the ACL, there, we have a few different research designs that we can implement. So, for example, as you can see all the way with the cartoons on all the way to the left, um, Lately, I've been uh, getting into cartoons a little bit and watching some cartoon movies. So I'm, I've been using the appropriate uh, figures here. Um, so you can see we can compare male athletes to female athletes while they do the same thing. The idea is that we have a high risk group, may, uh, the female athletes, comparing them to male athletes, which is the low risk group. Um, we put them into the biomechanics laboratory, whatever differences come out may be responsible for ACL tear. The same when we compare dancers to female soccer players, for example, because we know that female dancers have a low risk of ACL injury, although they do a lot of jump landing activities, while uh, female soccer players have a very high risk of ACL injuries. Again, we put them into the biomechanics laboratory and we see uh, uh, what type of differences they have. Or we can look at landing on one leg which is associated with a higher risk of ACL injury and landing on both legs, as you can see these little girls keeping rope all the way to the bottom uh, and see what differences exist there. Or we can look at the fatigued athlete and the unfatigued athlete and then again the fatigued athlete is at high risk for ACL injury, the unfatigued athlete at a lower risk. So these are some of the traditional designs that we have implemented into our laboratory that allowed us to develop these theories, the ligament dominance, strength dominance, and so on and so forth. So all that is experimentally based. Um, a much, much better, but also much more costly, time-consuming, difficult design to implement is to look at young athletes, as you can see in, in this, this photograph here, uh, before they when they start playing the sport when they're getting better right right about the time they hit puberty before they suffer any acl injury so we want to look at these athletes before any type of injury put them through the biomechanics laboratory while they're still uninjured and then follow them track them down prospectively and do some energy collect injury data every year and then see who tore the acl and then once we find who tore the ACL, we're going to have two groups, the uninjured group and the injured group. And then we can go back into the data we collected before they get injured and look at predictive factors. So we can look what factors predict these uh, injuries. And, and we've done some studies like that, and I'll share with you the results. Um, then the next video here, you know, I, that's probably not as interesting. Uh, most of you seem to have been into uh, a biomechanics laboratory, and uh, this is probably, many of you are probably traumatized from all these hundreds of, of hours that you spend into the biomechanics laboratory. Uh, Philippe and I uh, can share this pain with you because we spend a lot of time in the biomechanics laboratory ourselves. Uh, and if you click on this, you just see uh, one of our participants uh, who gave consent to have this video recorded. And you can see we put some EMG on them and then we standardize the task uh, where we have them uh, do it. In this specific case, it's a drop landing task. We have implemented different landing tasks as well as cutting tasks in the laboratory before. Um, and then after a lot of time and after digitizing curves and so on and so forth, then you get the stick figure and then uh, you can look at uh, the markers and the trajectory of them uh, in the laboratory. Again, you know, uh, thank you for Libby for sharing the link on the right. Um, and you can look uh, at the uh, moments and the angles and you can see the ground reaction force. Uh, the red arrow that is coming out from the floor once the athlete lands uh, and you know using some inverse dynamic we can calculate moments around the joint and forces and so on and so forth. Um, okay so let's take each one of these theories and look at the evidence behind them and let's start with the ligament dominance theory that has most of the evidence. Uh, so one study by Tim Hewitt, a seminal study back uh, 10 years, almost 10 years ago now, uh, did exactly this type of uh, difficult study design that I uh, discussed before where he, he took the athletes, put them into the biomechanics laboratory before they got injured, follow them for a couple of seasons and see who got injured. Knee valgus moment 
an angle where the two big uh, differences between the two groups. So the injured group was allowing their knee to collapse into knee valgus and the hip into internal rotation, uh, while the other group that did not get injured had a, a straighter landing technique. Um, also, when we look at videos, like some of the videos that you guys clicked on today and you looked at them, uh, we can, as, as we'll, I think I have a couple of pictures later, we can stop, the, we can take a, a snapshot and then uh, draw the arrows, calculate the angles, and then see uh, some of the common parameters that present when an ACL injury occurs. Um, some of the work that I've done uh, as part of my PhD shows that, uh, as well as many other people, uh, Carson published that a few years ago in Sports Health as a meta-analysis. Consistently, female athletes, they land with greater knee valgus angle and moment than male athletes. Um, and some of the more recent work that we have done um, in our laboratory where we compare uh, female athletes uh, with dancers and male athletes who have shown that female athletes consistently exhibit lower, uh, uh, that female athletes exhibit, exhibit higher knee values than the male athletes and dancers. So there is a mistake here on this slide. It should be higher instead of lower. Um, so uh, again, you know that th these are some of the designs that we have used that show how important knee valgus is in the uh, ACL injury world. Then moving on into the leg dominance theory, uh, again there is some evidence, and, and I'm going to move a little bit quicker uh, because we uh, I can see here that uh, we have probably like another 15 minutes or so, and I want to make sure I get into some of the more clinical stuff towards the end. Um, like dominance theory, there is a design that has been shown uh, from the original paper by Tim Hewitt. Uh, Philip and I, uh, three years ago, published a paper at JSM AMS uh, and where we demonstrated that female athletes exhibit higher side-to-side -side differences, both at knee valgus uh, angle as well as some of the foot uh, uh, kinematics. Uh, and that was also shown uh, at the peak values by uh, Kevin Ford uh, many years ago. So again, there is some evidence that uh, the leg down dominance theory may play a role into the ACL. Here you can look more specifically at one of the tables that we published. Uh, there is more asymmetry, and that does not seem like much, but you know, remember that two degrees within the same person, uh, because human beings tend to move quite symmetrically for the most part, so two degree uh, 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 difference on average between males and females uh, was uh, quite significant. Actually, the effect size was 0 0.7, quite large effect size in this uh, example, as well as ankle abduction was uh, higher uh, in uh, the, the, the difference was higher from side to side in females. Then looking into the trunk, again a very important component. Uh, most of the body in the humans are, are concentrated in the trunk. So being able to control that is, is particularly important uh, because it determines to a large extent the moments around uh, the lower extremity. Um, Billy Zazulak did a very smart study at Yale University where she had athletes uh, push against a resistance cable and then at random times she released the cable and obviously when you push against a resistance and it's released then you sway to the opposite side and then you stabilize. She had put a marker on them so she measured how far the sway and then she followed them for a couple of seasons to see who got injured. Uh, again, the female athletes who had poor, more body sway, so poor control of the trunk, they uh, went on to suffer more ACL and meniscal injuries. Um, in the study we published last year at the American Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, we showed that when you compare female athletes and female dancers, then the athletes uh, do uh, more lateral trunk leaning. So again, that is consistent with the trunk dominance theory. The quadriceps dominance theory, again, there is some evidence here. The, the perspective study that, uh, even though it was small in size, uh, by Zibis, the, the second bullet here, where he followed 55 team handball players prospectively, and those who tore uh, the ACL had lower hamstrings and quads, 
pre-landing activity, uh, there were quite a few ACL injuries that uh, powered the study to uh, look at that. Uh, Morgana, who I believe is present now, yes, I can see Morgana's name here, uh, she published a paper, it's not in press anymore, <laughs> it is, uh, has been published uh, last year, I believe, um, and uh, in this paper uh, we demonstrated, she did that when she came to New York uh, and uh, looked at some of the data we had collected uh, and uh, she demonstrated that pre-activation of normalized EMG increases for the quads but not for the hamstring when the height increases and we also showed that females that demonstrate greater pre-activation uh, of uh, medial hamstrings. Um, uh, and some other papers uh, have also shown uh, similar things. Um, uh, and, but as I said before, when you look at the uh, difference uh, in terms of straight knee landing, the, that just doesn't exist there. Uh, two years ago, we published a paper at KSTA where we looked at the uh, entirety of the literature and uh, most of the studies did not find a difference uh, in terms of the knee flexion angle at landing. So we're moving away from this theory that uh, it's the, the straight knee landing that causes the ACL injuries. Um, now looking here, uh, this is the same poor guy who uh, tore his ACL earlier uh, in the video that I showed you. And as I said, we can look at the landing on the left, and that is the successful landing, and the landing on the right, which is when he tore his ACL. I don't know if the arrows will move if I click on them. No, this... Oh, okay. Well... <laughs> okay, well, we can change the arrow here. Uh, so if you look at the knee... Oh, here. Yes, well, I guess uh, um, Felipe made, it, made them come in uh, through his magic fingers. Um, so you can look at uh, ligament dominance theory. You can see how straight the knee is when, uh, or Emmanuel actually was the one who's uh, doing the magic with the arrows. Um, so you can see the picture on the left and you can see how straight the knee is. While the picture on the right, when he tore his ACL, you can clearly see the greater knee valgus. Um, Emmanuel, please uh, do your magic again and let the other arrows come in. Perfect. And now if you can see at the vertical lines, you can see how the center of mass is aligned with the knee on the picture on the left, while on the picture on the right, which is where, oh, it was Felipe. Thank you for the correction, Emmanuel. Uh, well, on the picture on the right, the center of mass is far to the side. It's, it's, uh, and that creates a greater valgus moment. And that is consistent with the trunk dominance theory. So just by looking at these two snapshots, we can see some uh, evidence of the trunk and ligament dominance theory as uh, possibly being connected. But even qualitatively looking at these two pictures, you can see the very nice, smooth, uh, good alignment uh, on the picture on the left and the not so good alignment on the picture on the right that uh, and that was when uh, he tore his ACL. So now moving on, can we prevent uh, ACL injuries? Uh, well, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, that's the short answer that we can prevent ACL injuries on average in, in female players, in female athletes, we can decrease it for about 60%. Okay, with a good, quick injury prevention pro program that will place a typical warm-up, uh, it seems that about 60% decrease can occur. Uh, one of the better design studies by uh, Bart Mandelbaum out of California, he followed high school soccer players, very large numbers here, so you can see about 1,000 people in the injury prevention program, almost 2,000 in the control group, um, and you can see that he had, uh, a, you know, nine times more, 0 0.05 per 1,000 exposures and 0 0.47 per 1,000 exposures in control. Um, so that was a, a study, a large study that he did, and, and you can see here that there was a nine times greater possibility for an athlete 
to suffer an ACL injury when they just did a typical warm-up while if they uh, enrolled into an injury prevention program uh, they had time nine times less uh, risk it was not an RCT so the team self-selected uh, whether they wanted to participate or not and that obviously creates some methodological designs but again very promising data um, a bunch of meta-analyses have been published. Uh, again, consistently they show that studies that incorporate plyometrics are more effective. Uh, participation decreases the risk of injury. Again, the numbers vary here. 43.8% in uh, one of the more recent studies out, uh, out of uh, Sugimoto's group in Boston. Uh, however, here is the problem. Yeah, so you would be asking if these pro if these injury prevention programs are so effective then why do we still have ACL injuries and the reason is that they're not implemented so these programs unfortunately they're not widely implemented and the reason is that we need to train every year 108 athletes in order to prevent one ACL injury so understandably uh, coaches and athletes do not enroll into them uh, because the risk is relatively low um, and you know it's not a very efficient program so what I propose to you and the line of research that we have been pursuing uh, within my team and in in our laboratory uh, in recent years is try to find those that are at high risk and enroll only those with tailored specific uh, injury prevention programs to them. Uh, the same way you would not treat everybody who goes to the emergency room with pain in the abdomen the same way. Some of them may need surgery because they have appendicitis, some of them may have cancer, some of them they just have digestion problems and the treatment is quite different. The same way with ACL, you know, some people may just need to train their trunk uh, proprioception and control. Some people may just need strengthening. Some people may just need lower extremity proprioception exercises. Um, so they're getting into trying to find out exactly uh, what causes, so who has what deficit and treat only that. Um, so the, the components of a typical uh, injury prevention program, plyometrics, a lot of jump landing activities, high intensity plyometrics, footwork, agility drills, uh, but very important is the correction of the biomechanics. So it is very important that either a physiotherapist or even better with some objective measures, with some uh, either a camera or preferably within the bio, in the biomechanics lab, somebody needs to look at how the athletes move and provide them personalized feedback. Um, balance and core stability, very important components. While strength training alone has not been shown so far to be very effective, uh, we do have a meta-analysis going on. Uh, Thiago is uh, going to lead that. And I see somebody by the name Thiago here. I uh, hope it's uh, our student from our laboratory who's currently in Melbourne uh, having fun. Maybe he just decided to join uh, for some education tonight. And, and uh, we're really lucky to have Thiago in our group. Uh, he brings a lot of energy and power and he brings a lot of really great ideas um, in, in, in our team. Uh, and here are some examples of, uh, of uh, oh, it's a different Chiago. That's fine. Good. Uh, I, I, it appears that uh, it's, uh, the, the, this name is very popular in Brazil. We do have a Chiago in our laboratory. And uh, hopefully, you know, he's going to uh, be speaking to you at some point because uh, in Portuguese, his Portuguese is so much better than mine. Uh, and, you know, he has a, a lot of uh, wisdom to share with you. Um, here are some examples. Here are some, some pictures of uh, examples of uh, uh, exercises that have been shown to uh, be effective in reducing ACL injuries, bridging, core control exercises, proprioception, agility. You know, here you may be familiar with this device, the BOSU or any other similar devices uh, that challenge the balance of the athlete uh, have been shown, you know, they are a, a very important uh, uh, parts of injury prevention programs. Again, you know, here, you know, jump landing activities. Again, 
just pay close attention to the technique that this athlete demonstrates, the perfect alignment that this athlete demonstrates, uh, because uh, that is the more important part. We have to teach athletes and retrain their motor patterns. We have to retrain them to, uh, to, to land properly and demonstrate good technique, uh, as opposed to just strengthening or just doing the task. Simply doing the task is not actually effective. And you know, obviously, when the athlete becomes really good, then you uh, can uh, include some perturbation exercises to increase the challenge. Um, obviously, we would like to, uh, in a perfect world where we have plenty of uh, manpower and money, we would put all the athletes through the biomechanics laboratory and give them personalized feedback. Uh, you can uh, look at this link and uh, play the video. This is some work out of Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, where they do some real-time biofeedback. They just showed the athlete exactly the, the, the kinetics and kinematics of the landing, and they asked them to change it on the spot. And that works really well in that the athlete now knows what they do wrong and they can correct it. And if they correct it, they know whether they have corrected it well. However, that is both very expensive and uh, very time consuming and not applicable. The biomechanics laboratories are not available everywhere. Not everybody has access to them. Um, therefore, th we are trying to find out some different ways of uh, uh, identifying these athletes out in the clinic and out in the field. We have another athlete, uh, David Hillard, and another PhD student in our laboratory, David Hillard, who is developing these clinical measures in netball players, which is a sport that is very popular here in uh, Australia, as well as basketball players. So we're trying to take the research that we are doing in the laboratory out in the field. Um, in the meantime, uh, FIFA has developed a rather successful pro, uh, injury prevention program, the 11 Plus. Uh, it is available from this link. Uh, there is a, a wealth of information. There are videos. There, there are posters. Uh, they are available in Portuguese if you want to do a research project or simply share this information with the uh, teams in uh, Brazil. Feel free to do Felipe has also shared the link uh, on the chat uh, window on the right side. Uh, so I, I encourage you to browse through uh, the website and download the material that is there and uh, encourage the coaches and the physiotherapists who work with the teams to, uh, to do these programs. This, the beauty of this program is that it is very quick. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to implement it. It's very simple. It is specific for soccer. Uh, and there is plenty of research to show that it has been uh, mostly successful. Some studies have not come out as we were hoping, but uh, most of the studies show that they improve performance and decreases injuries. Um, just some of the research that we published uh, just a couple of months ago at the British Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, we, we wanted to answer the question if injury prevention programs work by changing the biomechanics of cutting. Uh, and again, the short answer is that if a good injury prevention program, yes, changes the biomechanics of cutting in a way that can prevent ACL injury. Um, so overall, the, the, those that are more successful, they were shorter, and this is encouraging. So they, they only required six weeks and they lasted for about 15 minutes each time and they placed the emphasis as we discussed earlier on biomechanical correction and individualized feedback. So this, when these components were present then the injury prevention programs were successful. Um, so the next step uh, in our laboratory for uh, ACL injury prevention, hopefully we're going to have a paper published next month in that. Uh, we presented this research uh, in France uh, last month and we're going to present the second part of this research in the Australian Physiotherapy Association Conference in the Gold Coast in October. Um, we took, it was an, a study that we did with uh, Tim Hewitt and his group uh, out in the United States and we took athletes, uh, as I said before, uh, from the beginning, before they get injured, we put them through the biomechanics laboratory and we asked them to do an unanticipating cutting task. So the goal of this project was to look at 
the prevalence of neuromuscular deficits. So do all are, how, what is the percentage of the athletes that are at risk for ACL injury just by looking at the biomechanics? And this is a very busy uh, diagram that you can see here, but if you allow me to deconstruct it for you, um, the, the main points are that about 40% of the athletes, they had no deficits. So they had very low problems that have been linked to ACL injury. So 40% of the athletes do not probably need any type of training because they seem to be at low risk for injury. Um, then, then we had two other groups, uh, one that was a combination of quadriceps and leg dominance theory, and that was about a quarter, that was the QL group. And then another group that had a combination of trunk and leg dominance deficit and a little bit of dominance deficits as a TLL group, again, that was 22%. Um, and the final group, that was the, the smallest group, had very high ligament dominance deficits. So if you look at this graph here, and if you look at the first two variables that are the, the knee valgus uh, range of motion and knee valgus moment, you can see that this, on average, this group had one and a half one to one and a half standard deviations higher than the mean. So that's a very large deficit that this group demonstrated, although, as I said, it was only 14% of them. And these probably are those that are, that are at the higher risk because they are so far off in terms of how they land uh, from uh, how they perform cutting tasks. Uh, we don't have much time left, just maybe like another four minutes if that's okay. Uh, just wanted to share with you a couple of clinical vignettes in terms of rehabilitation after ACL reconstruction. And uh, in summary, if you guys were able to uh, follow and understand the ligament dominance theories, uh, all I wanted to say to you is that the athletes who tear their ACL for the first time because they had one of these uh, deficits, they come to your clinic to see you and it's really important that we identify these biomechanical deficits and we treat them. Otherwise, even after surgery or after a conservative treatment, the athlete is going to go back to the field and get injured again. So, you know, again, it's important to be aware what these deficits are that are linked to ACL injury uh, and how we identify them into the these athletes and correct them. Um, th there is a variety of rehabilitation programs that have been published. Uh, the, some of these protocols have been published in the literature. They're based on the accelerated rehabilitation protocol uh, that Shelburne published uh, in the 90s. I guess some of the differences is that these protocols have evolved now and they are criterion based. So in other words, the athlete needs to, to meet certain criteria after surgery in order to progress to the next phase. They used to be time based and that was obviously wrong because uh, different patients progress in, in a different way. Um, again, if anybody needs any of these papers, feel free to email me. My email was on the first slide and it is widely available through Felipe and the group um, in, uh, at Unipampa. Um, feel free to email me and I'm happy to share any of this literature with you. So to summarize uh, some of the vignettes about rehabilitation after an ACL reconstruction, find the neuromuscular deficits from these four that we discussed earlier and fix it. Uh, keep in mind that return to play is only about the third and the first year and between half and two thirds by the second year. Uh, so, you know, just uh, discuss this with, the, uh, the, with your patients so they're going to have the appropriate expectations. Uh, your patients may ask you, do I need a brace? Uh, and the findings are that overall bracing does not result to better outcomes. Your patient may ask you if they need a CPM, which is a machine that even when they sleep, bends their knee and extends it continuously for many hours a day. Uh, I've seen that being used up to 20 hours a day. And the literature shows that does not offer any additional benefit. Um, emphasize symmetry. So it is important to fix strength, fix range of motion, make it as good as the other knee. Uh, some of the research that we've done uh, out, out in Greece, when I was in Greece, showed that using a brace or a sleeve results in lower tibial rotation deficits and may be beneficial in, in patients, especially those who have instability episodes uh, because it provides this extra proprioception. Uh, educate your patient. The most important thing is to educate your patient that they are at higher risk 
for osteoarthritis and it's really a decision they have to make uh, if they need to get if they decide to go back to sports because obviously that increases the risk uh, and you know just keep in mind that there is a 12 percent failure rate the younger your patient younger male patients so teenage male patients who have an acl reconstruction they are at much much higher risk for acl injury than uh, the rest of the group um, so the older athlete uh, has a much much lower risk for uh, retearing their acl uh, and also there are some differences in the technique. Uh, it is important to go to a very uh, experienced surgeon uh, and there are some differences that we've shown that the, the patients who had transtibial ACL reconstruction, they're slower to, to regain lateral agility while those who had another portal and that these are some of the minute details in terms of the surgery had a better outcome. Again, you know, if anybody is interested in the, this paper, feel free to email me. Um, then in summary, ACL tears are serious injuries. Uh, landing with knee valgus, hip adduction, and internal rotation may be the main reason that the females are at high risk for ACL injury. Uh, some of the other neuromuscular deficits are related to trunk control, quadriceps and hamstrings, and leg asymmetry may be contributing factors. Uh, injury prevention programs overall are effective but inefficient because we need to train too many athletes to prevent one injury. Uh, and then finally, rehabilitation after ACL reconstruction should address the underlying neuromuscular deficits. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators who are in the last 13 years uh, have worked with me very graciously and tolerated me uh, to, and then uh, as we were producing some of this research, you can see some familiar names here, Felipe, Morgana from your group. Um, and this needs to be updated because we have uh, quite a few uh, new students uh, that have joined us. Uh, and again, you can see my email up here. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, staying, uh, actually getting up uh, so early in Brazil. And I guess if anybody is from other parts of the world, uh, like Australia, staying up late. Uh, and um, I don't know, Felipe, if we have a couple of minutes, maybe uh, we can ask any questions, if anybody has any. Okay, so everybody can hear me? Todos me escutam? Okay, so Evangelos, can you hear me? Because it looks like something happened there. Bom, temos tempo para perguntas. Quem quiser pode digitar em português que eu posso traduzir para ele, não tem problema nenhum. E também depois a resposta, se vocês precisarem, eu posso ajudar. So, Evangelos, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Ah, yes. oh, ok. Great. So I have one question. Why the people, uh, while people is preparing questions for you, uh, do you know if this ACL injury it's more common to happen during training or competitions? Yes. Uh, uh, the the short answer is that during the actual games, it's much more likely to happen uh, as opposed to training. So it's it's less frequent in training, more frequent in games. And that may have to do with the intensity of the game, uh, that the athlete, you know, plays plays probably harder, tries harder when uh, they uh, they are playing uh, the actual competition. So, right, because one thing that I was wondering is like if you look at the fatigue effects. So we used to develop some fatigue protocols that took a few seconds or a few minutes to to actually fatigue the subject but during a actual game they will be fatigued uh, slowly let's say 
and maybe the fatigue protocols for laboratory uh, studies should consider protocols that will fatigue the subject slower than we in fact do and therefore we have a situation more close to the game game uh, condition i don't know if you what do you think about yeah definitely, yeah, definitely. I, think, I, think I think that's a think great that's that's a great point uh felipe um because in the laboratory and, and some of the work that we have done in our laboratory we fatigue the athletes in a very artificial way uh that you know we just have them um sometimes other laboratories they've been using the isokinetic device which is not very functional uh, again it can give us some important insight in what happens after fatigue but uh, i i think your point is very well taken that if we are going to make this research clinically applicable then we have to make the fatigue protocols resembling an actual game so that that should be the next step for us uh, that we should you know again there are all these technical things if you put the markers on and test a, an athlete and then uh, you send them out to play a soccer game then they come back in and you have to put the markers on so there is some, some error with replacing the markers and all that Again, there, there are some technical issues around that, but uh, once we solve those issues, uh, I've, I've seen some laboratories placing temporary tattoos around the marker, uh, so they'll know exactly where to, to place them again, and, and yeah, I thought that was a very smart idea. But yeah, once we overcome these obstacles, I think the next step should be uh, to, to have the athlete play an actual game and then bring them back into the laboratory. Great, thank you. Well, there's a question from Morgana. I think you can read them from the chat in the, in the right. Yes, so Morgana is asking how long it takes to uh, correct the landing pattern of an athlete who's uh, landing improperly. I, I think to a certain extent that is uh, individualized, so it depends on the athlete uh, and the extent of the deficits that they have. But on average, on the average athlete, it seems that 15 minutes of training, so instead of the warm up, because you know, people of my generation, when they were going out to the uh, uh, before we were doing sports, we were encouraged to do a lot of stretching. We know now that stretching does not prevent injuries. So a lot of the newer research protocols, uh, they replace the stretching with an injury prevention program, and that lasts about 15 minutes. And if the athlete does that for six weeks, then that, has, that changes the way they move that changes that the way they perform the tasks and that actually leads to fewer ACL injuries. Now the question, and I don't have an answer to this question, is does improvement last? We don't know. Uh, it seems that we have to provide a booster like the same way they do with immunization where they, they give you the immunization first and then a few years later another booster to uh, um, keep you immunized. Uh, it seems that the booster has to be every season. So at the beginning of every season for about six weeks and 15 minutes of, uh, of injury prevention, I would say. You're welcome, Morgana. Any more questions? Mais alguma pergunta? So Evangelos, I think we don't have any additional question for now. So thank you very much again for uh, participating and for giving us this amazing talk this morning here in Brazil and this evening in Australia. And I, I, I really hope to, that we can meet each other in person again very soon to, 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 to talk about all these topics and, well, drink some beers, you know and keep this collaboration between our groups that has been very productive and also serve it as a motivation for young students in the lab and in the university to to run uh, for his purpose let's say in science so thank you very much yeah, yeah. and thank you Absolutely. guys for participating
it was my pleasure, Felipe, and I'm also looking forward uh, to continue this collaboration uh, and push it forward as hard as we can. And, and I would also like to thank all the uh, participants for this. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm at your availability. Next time you guys invite me, I'll be there. We will be looking forward to that. So, thank you, Angel. Enjoy your weekend. Have a good rest. And we will see you soon, I hope. All the best. Okay, all okay, the best, all the best to you guys, to you guys too. Take care. Take care.